but I'm glad to be here today. Um, the title in the handout was uh, PBS in Classroom Management. So I hope you're not alarmed by the title of this uh, presentation. I am going to talk about classroom management today and positive behavior interventions and supports play a part of that. And um, how many of you are in schools right now that use positive behavior supports? Okay. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. And um, we used to be able to call it PBS, but then some lawyers for Big Bird sent me a letter and it said, it actually said cease and desist on it. It was my first cease and desist letter. We could not use the acronym PBS anymore because uh, we were going to do irreparable harm to the television company. So now we call it Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. I am at the uh, Tennessee Department of Education. We call it the Div Division of Special Populations now and um, in Nashville and have been there for a while um, and have been to many of your counties, but I only know one of you, so uh, I still have a lot of traveling to do. I want you to think back of all the teachers you had when you were in school yourself, your favorite teacher. And these are some of the reasons that people most often pick that person as their favorite teacher. <coughs> uh, some people said they smiled a lot. Some people said they were snappy dressers. Um, some, some people said they filled our day with meaningful activities. They gave us jobs that and knew we could do them. And so there are all kinds of reasons why teachers are our favorites when we go through school. Somebody tell me about their favorite teacher. Somebody raise your hand and tell me about your favorite teacher and why you like them the most. Yes? It's Randolph held me accountable. She held you accountable? Did you get in trouble a lot? Uh, no, because I was good at it. Okay. <laughs> Held you accountable. Okay, anybody else? Yes. My favorite teacher let me work at my own pace. Okay, she said her favorite teacher let her work at her own pace. Anybody else? She always was always in a good mood. It seemed like she really enjoyed her job and had a good job around her. Oh, a sense of humor in a teacher? Unheard of. Well, I hope through this presentation today you'll find some ways that you can be the kind of teacher that uh, your, your students will remember. And I just want you to remember that some of the suggestions in this presentation will work for you and some won't. Um, you have to be very flexible as a teacher. How many of you in here are general ed teachers? Raise your hand. Okay, special ed teachers? Okay, so no matter what you teach, I hope that some of these things can help you or make you think. Han Gunnar said that what your roles as a teacher were very, very valuable. You are the decisive element in the classroom. How you row the boat in the classroom goes the direction of everybody, okay? You possess tremendous power. You can make that child miserable or you can make that child happy to come back the next day. You can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. So when you go back to school, remember the power that you hold over all those kids. Okay. How many of you uh, are almost as old as me and you remember back, oh, probably 15 years, there was an infection going around called SARS. Yeah, it was in air conditioning units and hotels and things. Not this one, but. Um, <laughs> well, this, I want to talk today about PARS, not SARS. PARS is Positive Adult 
reinforcement syndrome, okay? It's something that I want everybody in here to catch. I'm going to start out by talking about proactive strategies. Um, then we're going to talk about reactive strategies. You now, sometimes we can do things to prevent challenging behaviors. And that works a lot of the time. Sometimes they happen anyway. So we'll talk about some of the things we do after they do happen. One of the biggest things you can do as a proactive strategy is to build rapport with your students. Abraham Lincoln said this, if you want somebody to get to be on your side, make them your friend, okay? And your grandmother may have said, it's easier to uh, catch a fly with honey than it is with vinegar, something like that. Building rapport will get you further with students than any point system you could ever devise any reward you get ever devised in classes. Um, and it uh, starts with number six. One of the ways you can build rapport is to give compliments and positive strokes. Uh, marriage counselors say that we ought to give our spouse four positive statements a day to each negative one. How many of you do that? Oh, come on. Well, you've got to go home and do it especially you ladies. Um, I've been told that men need more positive reinforcement than women. Is that true? Yes. The job stay more times before we hear you. No. <laughs> he, that's an excellent point. He said because you have to say it more times before we hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that. I've got to write that down. Um, okay. But your positive remarks have got to outweigh your negative remarks. Uh, when the students come in in the morning or in the class period, be at that door and greet them by name. What does that tell them? Yes. First of all, you know enough to, to be there to greet them. You know their name. And you might even throw in a little something like, oh, how's your dad doing? You get that new job yet? Or uh, your, your dog have its puppies yet? Or how's mom like her new car? You know, you can throw in all kinds of things like that. You can use in interest inventories to find out about them, and I'm going to show you some examples later on. Two by tens. How many of you ever heard of a two by ten? Oh, okay, okay. Two by tens are when you just listen to a student talk for two minutes about anything they want to talk about ten times a day or a week, or how, however you can fit it into your schedule. But you just let them talk about themselves and about what interests them. Become involved in their lives. Like I said, those little comments at the door when you meet them. I, uh, I did hear a, a statistic lately, and it's, it's research-based, that actually greeting students at the door when they come in decreases inappropriate behavior. So it's no longer a guess, it's actually proven now. And then you can use the 4-H method. Give them a handshake, a high five, hello, how are you? Share yourself with them. Um, I had one student who loved to know what kind of car all his teachers drove. Um, and that can build a basis of conversation. Put, put a picture of yourself up as, as a child, um, especially in those first few weeks of school when you're all getting to know each other. You might have pictures of them up. Put one up of yourself also. Um, talk about your hobbies, your family, so that they can ask you about things. Uh, I used to be, and I kind of hate to admit this, a big Cubs fan because growing up in Chicago, I was a Cubs fan. Um, and every day during baseball season, I would put the score of yesterday's game on the board. Uh, and, well, if you know anything about the Cubs, they always lost. But the kids were very interested in, uh, if I didn't put it up, they didn't mind. 
So they were involved with me and I was involved with them. Sometimes we don't like to admit our mistakes, but it, it helps us be human to them. And it's part of what I call being courteous to students. And we're gonna talk some more about that. Be open to feedback. And don't just toss it off, but you might be able to use that sometimes. Being courteous to students. Have you ever had somebody just really be rude to you or not, or not pay any attention at all? Well, sometimes we tend to be like that with students. But if we can say thank you, excuse me, I'm sorry, things like that, that actually empowers kids because we're treating them with respect that we want them to treat us. grocery store 
throws a tantrum because he wants some candy at the checkout aisle, and mom finally gives in, or dad, what has that done? It's worked for him, right? And like Dr. Phil says, how's that working for you? If, you're, if you, what you are doing isn't working, try something different in your classroom. Be flexible. Insanity, Einstein said, is continuing to do the same old thing and expecting something new to happen. And remember, no single discipline strategy or intervention is going to work with all students, even though their behavior may look the same and it might be a challenging behavior, because every child is different. We're all different. And if you do functional behavior assessments, you can find out why a child is um, doing that behavior. But a lot of times you as teachers kind of find it out. You know, if he makes, uh, if a child makes a lot of jokes in the classroom and all his peers laugh, what can you tell about why he's doing that behavior? What is he, what is he getting out of that? Yeah, he's getting his peers to laugh, right? So you can do little interventions informally that work for you and that work for your classroom. Well, some people say, that's not fair to do one thing for one student and one thing for another student. But being fair means giving people what they need, not the same thing for everybody. If you go to the doctor's office next week because you cut your arm, and you might need stitches, and in the waiting room, there's an expectant woman, there's a man with a broken leg, there's a youngster with brain tumor, and the doctor comes out and he says, okay, it's Wednesday, everybody's gonna get aspirin today. Because that's fair. But is that really fair? No, that's, that's not fair because it's not what those individuals need. Some of us wear glasses, some of us wear hearing aids, or, or use a wheelchair. Um, so remember, when you think of fairness, think of what your kids need and not necessarily the same thing for everybody. I know, um, there's a lot of concentration right now on academics. Um, RTI is, um, you're going through RTI training in the schools. How many of you have been through that already? And the emphasis is largely on academics in RTI, but it's just like um, academics. Behavior <coughs> and discipline should be approached individually also, okay? We can't expect to individualize academics, but behaviorally treat everybody the same. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so we want to avoid doing that because if we took the time to find out why a child is performing a certain behavior, it would save time. Instead of doing five things that we, we know won't work, let's find out what's happening and then try something. Okay, we want sound values for our kids, not necessarily the same rules. If you have the same rule, you might administer it individually. It all depends on that child. Okay, we talked a second about interest inventories before. They help build rapport, they help you get to know your students. And some of them might look like this. Um, for instance, you can just ask them questions about themselves. What are you proud of doing? Or what do you do after school? What's your favorite television show? What's your favorite food? Here's another one, a little bit more complicated for older kids. What do you do in your free time? What's your favorite band? What's your favorite band? Horn. 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 Okay. Anybody else like Horn? Anybody know what Horn is? <laughs> I'm just 
kidding. Um, kids like doing this too, and then can share it with a peer, and then you all, if they don't want you to see it, that's okay. If you don't, if they don't want you to share it, that's okay. But it is a good way to get to know your students. Here's another one. Um, a little, little bit more sophisticated. Okay, so those are beginnings of proactive strategies. Here's another proactive strategy, is classroom organization. Seating. Let's just talk for a few minutes about the physical classroom, okay? I know that every one of you probably seat certain students in certain places just to avoid problems, right? Those are, that's a proactive strategy. And um, for instance, attention deficit disorder students do well in a U-shaped uh, seating arrangement where they are on the end because they can see everything but they don't have to necessarily get involved in everything. In your classroom, do you have uh, good traffic flow patterns? Um, is it wide open spaces where kids can run and move? And, and if you have somebody who, who is a runner, um, that's not the best strategy for you special ed teachers to have. You'd like to have things in their way that they have to get around. Um, does the area suggest its function? For instance, uh, do you have a reading area, computer area, a place where you can eat lunch or have snacks, uh, a quiet area? If you have the resources, it's an excellent thing to do because students always know then if they go to that area what they're supposed to do. A mistake area? That's kind of like a time out place. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's just another term for a, a mistake area is where you go and maybe you have to think about what you're doing. Or it could be academic too and not have a negative connotation at all. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes some of us make as teachers is sitting behind that desk and as, you, as you're going to see, I, I place a big emphasis on moving around. Don't be static in your classroom. There are three things that really can work for you, if, even if you're in high school, to all the way down through kindergarten. Walking around students can prevent most inappropriate behavior. You know, like, I see these guys talking back to right now, but if I walk this way, even if I'm not looking at them, they do. They stop talking. Um, you know, you can do this in the classroom. You can do this in the hall. How many of you are like middle school or high school people? Okay. Oh, lots of you. Okay. Walking around the students, you hear lots of stuff. Uh huh. Big deterrent against inappropriate behavior. Talking to students keeps you involved. Students often tell you stuff they won't tell other people, especially if you built that rapport that we talked about earlier. And looking. Watching students is another big determinant. So you want to walk, talk, and look. Um, that's why I don't want anybody behind their desk. I don't want them sitting at their desk when the bell rings and the students start coming in the room. Even between classes, walk, talk, and look. You can really prevent a lot. Now we all make mistakes. And sometimes they show up in the classroom. But we can turn mistakes around. We want to build on them. We don't know if this guy's going to hit that rock or not, do we? We're going to practice with our students. When they make a mistake, we want to practice. We want to um, praise their effort. A lot of us as teachers don't praise effort. 
all we want is a perfect finished product. But if I say, you have worked so hard on that, I'm proud of you. That will be as big a reinforcer as if she had finished. Actually, in the brain, you have a place that um, mistakes show up. And if you practice, that trains that spot in that brain. And so hopefully we can learn to not make the same mistakes over and over. Mistakes are proof of effort. If you never make a mistake, have you tried anything? No. And they're unfortunate, but they're not catastrophic, right? Students want to be perfect for you. So they tend to attribute being successful in your classroom uh, to ability. But it's not just ability, it's effort also. Because you could have a really, really highly intelligent child that doesn't put forth any effort, and a child who is just in the middle of the cognitive scale, and they might accomplish a lot more than that really smart child. This guy's going to try something. He's going to try. I don't know if it's going to succeed, but you can help change that concentration on ability to effort. Okay, praise them for their effort, even if they don't complete, get everything perfect. If they've tried, please praise them for that. This is Waldo. He's he's a big cat in a small box, but he got it all in there. You can say things like, you can finish that tomorrow. The work you did today is absolutely fantastic. You tried your best, try it again tomorrow. You have really kept at it today. Thank you for your hard work. Okay, another thing that we can use in the classroom is schedules. Uh, we use schedules all our, all our life. How many of you got here because you, you used growth signs? Okay. Those are like schedules. They're visual supports. Uh, you know that yellow line that goes down the middle of the road? Why is that there? To show, yeah, to show you which side of the road to stay on, right? To keep you from hitting another car. We depend on those things in our lives. Do you do these things? You use memory strategies. What's the one for remembering um, the planets? My very educated mother just bought My very educated mother what? Just served as done. There you go, that's a memory strategy. Do you use a planner? How many of you have a planner? Uh -huh. uh, do you make lists at home or at school? You betcha, boy. If, if I have a list and I did something that's not on the list, I write it on there and cross it out anyway. Because it gives you a feeling of you finished something. Um, I, I heard on the radio this week about the um, Congress or the um, Supreme Court leaving their biggest chore to last. And now they don't know if they're going to get through it. I thought, well, duh. Doesn't everybody work like that? I do all my little things first so I can see that I'm succeeding and then I save the big one for last. So I guess the Supreme Court's pretty, pretty uh, much like us. You use verbal reminders or look at pictures on a menu. You know, the pictures on a menu always get me because I choose one and that never is like that when I get the food. But I always I use it anyway. Checklists, okay, we, we depend on these things, and you can teach your kids, especially to make lists. List makers are more successful than people who just try to remember things in their heads. Okay, transitions are difficult in a lot of places in our schools. Um, not only between classes, but between activities. Uh, between language and math, between 
lunch and recess. Anytime you make a change, it's a transition. And some of the things we can do is to make sure your directions are clear and with advance warning. For instance, if you know recess is ten minutes until the end, you can say ten minutes, you got ten minutes. Give them a chance to get that through their heads so that they it won't be a big surprise when you when the bell rings or you say, okay, line up. Um, any type of supports like that that you can give kids in transitions is going to make them make, going to make those transitions much smoother. And remember, walk, talk, and look. If you don't remember anything else, when you go back, try to remember walk, talk, and look. Noise in our classroom sometimes isn't so bad. Claire Jones is a, a lady who works with attention deficit disorder students. She has a practice out in Arizona. And so she treats a lot of professional athletes. And they have a summer camp. Uh, some of the um, American League and National League ball players go to summer camp in Arizona. Well, she gets professional athletes in there. What do you think is the best place for a uh, person with attention deficit disorder? What position on a baseball team is the best position for them to play? Catcher. Catcher? Pitcher. Why? Constantly moving, got to be focused, right. Where would you not put a person with ADD? Yeah, especially right field, yeah. Even if they've got a cannon for an arm, please, you know, they kind of go to sleep out of right field. So she, she does a lot of research, and um, she's found out that most of us, I'm not one of them, I have to admit, work in a place with some background noise better than if it were absolutely quiet. And um, most students prefer to work in, a, in an environment with music. She says the, the heavy beats, the um, regular heavy beats are really good as long as the vocals are not involved, because that, that does tend to distract. So it's okay if kids say they can't work without, if you have kids at home, and they say, I can't work without the TV on, or I can't work without that music going, it's okay. Teach your students to take breaks. A lot of times, in, in my special ed um, days, kids will get frustrated. And they get frustrated because they need to get away from that work for a while. But they didn't know how to ask for a break, or didn't know enough to take a break. We take breaks, don't we, from our work? It doesn't have to be outside of the classroom. You could have everybody stand up and stretch, or let them stretch and uh, do a yoga move anytime they needed to. Like right now, I can tell some of you are needing really bad to do a downward dog. Go ahead, I don't care. Um, anything to get them up, get them stretched, and then they can concentrate better when they go back. It doesn't have to be long. You know, two minutes, five minutes, it really helps. Uh, learning techniques to relax and to stretch really help them understand that, oh, I'm getting frustrated now, getting angry at this work because I need to take a break. Then, then I'll come back and I'll, I'll be able to do that. Some kids can work longer than others without a break, just like we do, but um, it pays them to, it pays to teach them to recognize when they need it. Okay, let's talk about rules for a couple minutes. Rules in your classroom. How many of you have rules posted in your classroom? How many of you have to take it at least a week at the beginning of the school year to teach those rules? Okay. 
What does it look like? What does it sound like? Excellent idea. Because if we don't teach them, they can say, oh, I don't know what you meant by that. We can even give them a quiz, and then when they break a rule, we could say, hi, oh, Johnny, you got 100 on your, on your rule quiz. You know, you should, you should know. So teach them and use them. And these are some of the things that informally or formally we need to convey to our students. How much talking can you take in your classroom? Um, how much help? If you raise your hand 10 times in 20 minutes, am I going to help you every single time? Uh, how much movement? How much walking around the classroom can I do as a student? Um, and how much do I want you to be uh, participating, okay? Do I want you to answer every question or do I want you just to have your hand up once every 10 minutes? Things like these uh, questions help, help them to know the expectations you have in your classroom. Enforcing the rules. never enforce rules and then all of a sudden you come down hard. That's, that's not what builds, um, how should I say, trust. It's not the severity of a, con severity of a consequence, it's the certainty that it's going to happen. If, you, if your rule is don't leave the classroom without permission and you the fifth time the student does that and you come down so hard, you send him to the principal or you, you send him to ISS or something, that's not as effective as if you have enforced that every time he's left the room. Because if you enforce it every time, they know what's going to happen. Same thing at home, too. If you have parents of your kids that um, ignore behavior and then all of a sudden they blow up, it's not as effective that way as if they enforce the rules every time. Okay, appropriate consequences for breaking rules. Um, positive behavior supports teach appropriate behavior and they reward appropriate behavior, but there are consequences for rule breaking. They need to be appropriate, though. You know, Bart Simpson was standing up at the chalkboard writing every day, I will stop pulling the hair in front of you know. Those aren't very appropriate consequences. They need to teach. Consider things like, does this consequence stop this, the disruptive behavior? Okay. Does it teach the correct behavior? Does it teach responsibility and thinking, not just blind obedience? And does it make sense? Um, can you explain, for instance, to parents or to the child how this consequence will provide long-term benefits? And most importantly, would you have to go to the especially Unfortunately, oh, uh, there have been things in the news in the past couple of years about uh, teachers who have been sarcastic to their students or demeaning, and those aren't things we want to have done to us, would it? We need to model rules, too. I'm a big believer in teachers obeying the rules because we want students to obey the rules. Do we? Last night. Do we talk during fire drills? That used to really get me because I wanted my kids to be quiet during the fire drill, which is where they're supposed to be. But there was a group of teachers over there talking away. And it's hard for kids to understand why they can't talk, and the teachers do. Always return homework in a timely manner. Sometimes you can't. But those are the times you use those manners that you, towards the kids. Like, gee, I'm really sorry, Jane, that I didn't get your homework graded last night, but our electricity went out, 
plan to take care of that. I'll do it today, okay? A nice, sincere apology with um, explanation really helps. Do we use put downs or sarcasm? Or even name calling? Um, when kids get to about the fourth grade, they start to understand sarcasm. But we have to be very careful, especially with kids, uh, like kids with Asperger's, they do not understand sarcasm, okay? They believe everything you say. That one teacher I mentioned that I used to teach on the hall from that was real rowdy, she used to say, um, if you do that one more time, I'm gonna hang you up by your heels in that doorway. And of course, everybody would laugh and she'd get their attention. But if she had a child with Asperger's in her class, he'd probably run screaming to the office because he would believe her. Uh, do we eat or drink in the class without letting the kids do the same? Do we leave class anytime we want? These are just examples. Um, I applaud you if you obey the same rules as, as your kids are expecting to uh, obey. By doing that, we show our students that the rules are there for a reason, and they make sense, and that we respect their effort to obey the rules. So be what you teach. If you want to teach respect, um, appropriate behavior, then you do that first. Okay, now, strategy. All kids aren't perfect, remember, so sometimes all of our preventative and our proactive strategies might not work. Grandma's law. First, we call it first then. Um, and if you're a little bit inretentive, this really can take you to extremes. First, I've got to do my homework, then I can play. And mom and dad might say, first, first uh, bath, then TV. Something like that. But grandma used to always say that um, if you do what I ask you to do, then I'll do what you want to do. Have you ever heard somebody say, now if I give you this cookie, will you promise me to eat all your dinner? That's giving the reinforcer first, and then after that, it's, who knows if the dinner's going to be eaten. This is called a mystery motivator, and that's an envelope with a question mark on it. Um, here's, how you, here's how you use this. You choose some rewards, and then you, you uh, write that reward on a piece of paper and put it in that envelope. Okay. Um, on that little chart, with the days, you're going to use some invisible ink to put an M or whatever letter you want to use on a couple of those days. So that nobody can see where the letter M is. Say you're working toward completion of work or, or doing your work without bothering others. If a student does that, they get to um, check that square and see if there's an M on that square. If there is, they get the reward. Now sometimes kids are going to be really disappointed that they didn't get it, but you'd be surprised at how hard they keep trying after they miss it one day, they'll try it again, they might get it that day. That's one thing that you can use in the classroom as a mystery motivator. You can do all sorts of um, tweaking of that too. You don't have to do it exactly that way. But the thing is, it is intermittent reinforcement that he doesn't always get the reinforcer, but he, he'll keep trying because he never knows when it's going to happen. Some low or no cost reinforcers. Um, kids sometimes are reinforced by the craziest things. Uh, maybe just sitting in your, in your chair and twirling around for three minutes. Or uh, helping another child with their work. And some kids love to run errands. I had a student once who, his main objective 
in free time was to string bookshelves. Hated it when the books were turned over or out of order. And in the interest inventories, you can often find out stuff like that, what they really like to do. You might use dots um, with your initials on them, and you can use those at different times, like uh, if work is completed, if they're doing the right behaviors that you've asked for, new rules. Um, and then they can be turned in later for things that um, they have chosen out of the A lot of kids like to just collect dots. Say, oh, I've got 300 dots here. You never even turn them in. You just have to be careful that your initials uh, are not uh, duplicated by the students. They could get their own dots and duplicate them. So you have, to, you have to be real careful. Uh, a menu of reinforcers, you can have up on your wall or in the reinforcement book, and they can choose what they want. They can choose ahead of time what they're working for if, if somebody's working on a special project or something. How many of you know Brown White? that you might use in your classroom. If you have, if you are recorded with a goofiness coupon, you can have five minutes of that being goofy, silly, silly, or disgusting in class. <laughs> but if, if no one smiles within one minute of seeing it, your coupon expires. Okay? Um, out of seat for no good reason, you earn that coupon and you can get out of your seat for no reason. For, and there's a time limit. Voluntary timeout, go relax in the quiet place for a while. Getting the last word coupon. I could never get the last word in at home, so I had to do it at school. And a bugging coupon. Uh, maybe you can give somebody it, uh, five minutes to, to bug somebody else, and it says in the, in the fine print, you may not use your normal voice while bugging. Left eye must remain closed, no criminal behaviors. So it turns into a kind of a fun activity for kids. If they earn these, it doesn't take long. You might, and I would change it to two minutes. Five minutes is a long time. Um, it just gives them a break, gives them a reward, and you know some of those kids in your classes that love attention? Standing up and telling a joke to the rest of the class might be just what they need for another two hours worth of work. Here's a coupon for getting out of class free. And you fill it out, they can go you know, to the water fountain, the bathroom, reports home, Kids love when their most kids love when their parents find out they've been doing a great job at school. Self-monitoring is something that um, is real uh, good skill to teach kids because again they they become aware of when they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it might it might look like this. It can look a thousand different ways, but it might look like this: this little sheet of paper or index card on their desk with this on it, and um, every 10 minutes, maybe less for somebody who's really having a problem, or when you walk by, that means she can, she can circle yes on her, am I working? She, and then turn it in later for a special reward. Okay, now, sometimes you have behaviors and you have to decide, all right, do I do something about it or should I just let it go? So you might ask yourself these questions. Is that behavior interfering with his or her ability to do what I ask, perform the task, or follow a lesson? Is it interfering with the rest of the class's learning? 
is the behavior interfering with my ability to teach? And if the answer is yes to any of those, you probably need to what? Intervene, right. So then we would go to our reductive strategies, okay? When, when proactive strategies haven't worked, and they won't always work, sometimes behaviors happen and we have to res uh, resort to reductive strategies. Now there's an old Chinese proverb that says, do not use a hatchet to remove a fly from your friend's forehead. What do you think that means when it comes when we're talking about reductive strategies? Use the minimum strategy to begin with, right? Don't use um, you're grounded for eight years with a child. You only need to say you're going to miss recess today. Okay. Start with the minimum or the least restrictive. Sometimes you can ignore the behavior and then reward another behavior. For instance, if this young lady here keeps talking to her neighbors, and I want to reduce that if I ignore her talking, but then when I see her at least pick up her pencil and put the first letter on her paper, I can say, oh, nice. Or if she picks somebody else's book up, I can say, oh, that was nice of you to do that. And I'm going to look for anything to reward her about. And sometimes that will work. A response, a response cost system, I know some of you have used this, you may not know what it means. It's where you pull a card or you earn uh, coins or points for different periods during class. Um, most often we tend to use this in a negative way, and that, that is uh, the first check you have to pull your card, the second check you have to uh, call your mother. The third check, you go to the principal's office, that type of thing. And for some kids that works, other kids, it works better to let them earn things instead of taking away things. Group contingencies um, means I'm gonna let this whole side of the room have a special reward if they do what I ask them to do, okay? And you can use that in, in various ways. Sometimes those work. Um, sometimes you have a real hard kid in there that they're not going to let that group earn anything. So you have to think of something else then. Behavioral momentum works a lot of times. And, and that works like this. If you're resistant to doing, to doing what I ask you to do, say, um, making the transition from recess to math class, I might say, um, I'm going to think of some things that I know she can do, that she likes to do. Um, uh, Jane, put your sharpness pencil. She loves to sharpen pencils. Um, and she goes to sharpen pencils. Or, or I might walk my hand. Oh, would you do that? And yeah, she picks it up for me. Um, uh, those are things that she's going to do because she does them automatically. She likes to do things, and then I might say, "Can you do your math without this?" And because she's in that habit of doing those three things that I've asked her to do already, she, odds are that she will get her math work out. And at least we've gotten over that that hump. It's a trick, yes, it's a trick. But it's not illegal, so it's not a bribe, okay? A lot of people say these things are bribes. Well, bribes are, bribes are for illegal behaviors, okay? This is positive reinforcement for what works. So that's behavioral momentum. And if you engineer that into your classroom, uh, you might do that four or five times a day. <clears throat> For instance, if uh, here's another way of, of getting your kids to uh, do things they might not want to do, and it's kind of fun because if they say things like "Sure, I will," or "Absolutely, Mr. Smith," or 
Sure, I'd love to. As a group, it becomes fun, but it adds to them wanting to do it. Okay, when, when, I, when I give a direction, I want this side of the room to say, absolutely, Miss Copas. And, and I want you guys to say, when I give your direction, I want you to say, I'd be more than happy to. Okay, you ready? Tell me the time. Absolutely, Miss Copas. so you can teach him something because that's totally, totally false. Use that academic accomplishment that he might do, even if he can only write the alphabet, to make him feel good about himself. And then he will do more work for you, you can make him feel better, he'll do more work, and it's, it's a circle effect. Power struggles. It's usually better to avoid power struggles. You know, kids like to hook you, um, but we do want to acknowledge that they have power, okay? We can offer them choices, not just token choices. We can challenge their refusals to do work respectfully and not just um, use sarcasm or, or treat it like it doesn't mean anything. We can ask for their opinions and be courteous to them. And these are the three P's. When we ask, when we want to get in a kid's face, but we need to talk quietly to them, we might use privacy, eye contact, even if they're not looking at us, and proximity, get close to them. When power struggles do occur, you know, kids will have that hook. I used to have a boy in my class that talked about my large rear end. And I could have gotten really upset and offended, but what I tried to do was say, oh yeah, I gotta go jogging tonight a whole lot. And kind of slough it off with humor and, it, and then go on teaching. And that, that pretty much worked. Um, we can say, let's discuss that after class. I'd be glad to stay with you and talk about it. Or we can just listen and say, thanks for your feedback. We're acknowledging that they have refused, that they want something else, but we're saying, let's do it at a more important time. Okay. So, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the greatest
everything in this world is not so much where we stand as in what direction we're going. So if you contract the infection cars, remember, positive adult reinforcement syndrome, you can send your students out and they can give that to other people. And they won't have to be quarantined at all. Okay. If you have questions, I know the time is up. If you have questions, you, uh, you can come up afterwards. And uh, otherwise, go home and spread infection everywhere.